Welcome back to the program, still on security matters, for a professor of international relations and the dean of the Faculty of Management and Social Sciences at the Bayes University, Mr. Osita Agu. The root cause of terrorism is frustration. He made this known during the maiden lecture series for his late colleague, Professor Agaba Uche of the Nigerian Institute of International Affairs in Lagos. Speaking on the title Terrorism and Nigeria's Foreign Policy, Professor Agbu trailed the origin of terrorism in Nigeria, the modifications of it, and its ties to international groups such as Al-Qaeda. He blames the porous border for Nigeria's problems with terror. And especially the very large border we have has implications for addressing some of the cross-border Ter uh, terrorism and armed banditry that we experience. Nigeria has over 1,000 kilometers of border with the Republic of Benin, Niger, and Cameroon, and about 75 kilometers of border with Chad. So this has a lot of implications for our domestic security, because many of these terrorists, many of the criminalities, many of the armed banditry come in through these borders or it can be perpetuated in Nigeria, they move over to the other country and they come in from the other country again to perpetuate this act. Well, my colleagues at the Nigerian Institute of International Affairs will attest to the fact that several years ago, we carried out a study in the northeast of Nigeria and the northwest of Nigeria. Even before the issue of Boko Haram came on board, we visited my degree and the border areas and we were able to document that there is a lot of criminality and armed banditry going on on the border areas of the northeast and that the federal government should do something about it. Security expert Chi Jin Won who joins us now to speak more on this. Thank you so much for speaking to us. Thank you for having me. First off, do you agree with the opinion of some analysts that the root cause of terrorism is frustration? Well, I would, I would maybe qualify that a little bit in that um, Terrorism in of itself is a tool. So it's the same way warfare or diplomacy is a, is a tool of imposing your will upon somebody. So terrorism is, is not necessarily caused by frustration, but frustrated people would use terrorism if they find no other outlet for their, um, for their frustrations or, for, or no other way to impose their will or to get their, their way. So in Nigeria, you have the problem of, of extremely poor governance and, you know, it's difficult to get access to justice or to get access to um, to redress for for, um, for any grievance. And that leads a lot of parties, you know, whether we talk about Boko Haram or the Niger Delta militants, to use terrorism or violence as a means to get their point across. Yeah, and this is the security situation remains volatile in the Sahel region. ISIL and Al Qaeda affiliates are collaborating with each other to, you know, undertake attacks in West Africa, especially in Burkina Faso, Mali, and Niger. ISIL also continues to operate in Libya. You know, can the war on terror be won? You know, by combining social and economic strategies to military approach, or do you think? This is what, and do you actually think this is what Nigeria has been doing? Well, Nigeria hasn't necessarily had a joined up approach to uh, combating terrorism. And I think that's the problem. There's been a lot of talk about a joined up approach. So using obviously the hard um, elements, so the military means, police, detective work, intelligence work with developments, um, you know, so bringing governance, schools, hospitals, all of these kind of things. But this hasn't really happened. Partly because, you know, the military element hasn't been nailed down. So security, without security, you cannot have development. So you need to get that security part right. But the security element is very complex because if you go in too hard, you end up, you know, causing a lot of damage, killing a lot of people and essentially alienating the people you're trying to help. But if you go in too soft or you go in incompetently, then the um, insurgents or the terrorists, you know, have the run of the place and you, you can't get anything done. So it's a little bit of a complex mix. You, there's no one solution. It's not about going in and hugging people and then everything will be okay. And likewise, it's not about going in and killing everything that moves and everything will be okay. It has to be a balance. And getting that balance right is where is where most countries, not just Nigeria, struggle. Yeah, and I was also saying, you know, combining social and economic strategies to military approach, can the war on terror be won by doing that? 
Uh, that's that has to be the way. But as I said, the problem is where do you lead to? And I'm oh, sorry, wrong. Which of these do you lead, you lead off with? So if you lead off with a military approach straight from the beginning, you will almost inevitably fail, which is what Nigeria generally tends to do. Whenever there's a problem, there's generally a very aggressive, very violent response from the state, which then leads to more people being alienated and then the problem uh, being exacerbated. And then once the problem now is out of control, you see the government offering to talk or offering amnesties at a point when people are already hardened and radicalized. So it's that getting that balance right of knowing when there's a problem, when there's a grievance, finding those mechanisms whereby you can address it. And that addressing is not just by paying people or by settling people or by arresting people, but finding genuine solutions to the problems. And then if there is still no way, then you have to balance that with the hard elements, with the military, the police and the intelligence services. All right, just before I let you go, the major issue around the world now is the coronavirus. Do you think this could have any impact on global terror? I th it's the impact of, of the coronavirus right now is, is really... Um, it's, it's an unknown unknown, if you, if, you, if you pardon the phrase, because we're looking at an effect on the economy. We're looking at the effect on, on transport. So, for example, if the global economy tanks, you'll have a huge amount of joblessness, general social unrest. What does that mean? Will it mean that people will start saying, OK, there's been um, maybe social programs for this set of people and not for us, and that leads them to rebel or to join a, an insurgent group? Or will the coronavirus attack insurgents because they don't have access to good... Um, uh, healthcare, they will also become casualties. So there's 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 a lot of unknowns about it. It's just th that all governments need to really prepare and really essentially prepare for the worst and you know hope for the best. All right then, security expert Chidi Wanu, thank you so much for speaking to us on Network Africa. Thank you for having me. Well, female rappers in Senegal are finding strength in numbers through a hip hop collective as they're using. TPO to lift the veil on gender equal inequality and push their careers forward. For Muslim rapper Aminata Gaye, whose lyrics promoting female empowerment can cause a stare, the all-female group is a welcome development. <laughs> From under her veil, Aminata Gaye uses her lyrics to promote female empowerment, but in Muslim-majority Senegal, that can be controversial. Some don't think a Muslim woman should rap about forced marriages, rape and female genital mutilation. Amid bruising comments from critics on social media, Gay, whose stage name is Minat Nevoili, meaning Mina, the build one, has found strength in numbers by joining an all-female hip-hop collective. It's not easy to be a female rap artist here, so we speak about all that. We speak about all the problems that women face. Mina Lavoili is one of around 70 women that make up the Genja Hip Hop Collective. It was co-founded by Ina Tim, who started her career taking photographs of rappers, but today shoots music videos. We're in a country where many things are often a taboo. There are so many things that are not spoken about, which is often the source of problems, especially for women. At first, it was just a WhatsApp group designed to get female rappers and artists to meet and share experiences. Three years later, and it counts DJs, slammers, sound engineers, graffiti artists, and even an urban musical orchestral conductor amongst its members. They've organized the festival and are working on their first album, and they've had a political impact as well. Genji was on the front line of protests last year opposing violence against women, joining forces with the Daffodoy Collective and lawmakers in a successful campaign to get tougher sentences for convicted rapists. Well, that's it on the program today. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Layo Adegoki.